Christmas stocking, bursting with toys, puzzles, dolls and mementos. This is the Victorian Albert Museum of Childhood. Today, it's host to the Quisium. Welcome to Bethnal Green in East London and Great Britain's finest and largest collection of childhood memories. Over the next four rounds, we'll be unwrapping clothes, dolls' houses, baby walkers, games, trains and automobiles and asking a series of questions that'll bring out the child in us all. Won't it, kids? Yes. 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 Good. Yes, sir. But which boys and girls are coming out to play here today? We've assembled our old favourites and regulars for you well. It's Christmas and no one else was available. <laughs> On my right, Milk Monitor Lars Tharp is joining forces with teacher's pet, Dr Nina Ramirez. Opposite them are the naughtiest girls in the school. <laughs> Professor Kate Williams and on a return visit to our playpen, writer, historian and art expert, Ali Rubenhold. So, this museum, I think, I've got a theory actually, that lots of people bring their kids here, but actually it's adults mm. who stand in awe in front of these cases. Mm. Lars, have you got a favourite toy? I do, and I'm afraid he's awaiting repair. He's my bumser. You're what? <laughs> bumser is the Danish for Teddy bear. I see. Yeah. Right. Cute. What about what about over here, Hallie? Have you got a favourite toy that you still hang on to? Ooh, no, but I'll tell you what I really want. I want a really old big doll's house. Yeah. Did you have a doll's house when you I were a kid? I did. It was made yeah. out of tin. And it just wasn't as satisfactory as some of these gorgeous antique ones that you can see here. I definitely had a doll's house, which we used as a garage. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's time to get our cuisine game out of its box and carefully study the rules on the inside of the lid. You must buzz in to win an open question, which will gain you one point and the opportunity to answer a special two-point bonus. So, fingers at the ready, no talking in the back. Here is your first question. It's a Christmas decoration from the Erzgebirge region of Germany. How do you get the sails at the top to spin? Oh, candles. 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 You yes. light the candles and off they go. Oh, so, here's your specialist question coming in now. Right. What is this? And how did losing a piece of it drive Daddy mad? This is from a cabinet that was called Lady Char... I think it's Lady Charlotte's cabinet. Is that right? And I think that it was the... It was owned by George the Fourth. So these were some of the earliest jigsaw puzzles put together. And, yes, and they put together all the various maps. And OK, so uh, you're getting close. We've got Lady Charlotte, Lady Charlotte Finch. Finch. And she was the governess. So tell me what you see there and what happened then. Well, I think what we have here is, is North America mm. going up to the Arctic mm. circle up there. And... Uh, the thing that immediately springs to mind is that when George III heard that he had lost his American colonies, mm. he went even madder than he was anyway in the first place. Mm. That's, I don't know whether that's what you're getting at. It is indeed. A piece so of this, a large chunk of it, which is mapped out there in different sections, was actually lost by George III. Right. And, and he, as it were, uh, got annoyed about that. Mad in the American sense, although he was considered to be mad uh, originally. So I'll give you two points for that because we have worked we our that. way there. So, um, <laughs> We're smiling tell me, here. you're smiling away. Do you, I mean, do you know anything more about Lady Charlotte? I know she was the governess of the children of George III. And How many it, children were there? Well, there were seven sons and six daughters that survived. This was apparently in Kew Palace and it is the puzzle cabinet, the dissected piece cabinet. Dissection cabin. map. Dissection map. And it really shows, I think, how many of the toys here are both educational and also playthings at the well, same time. That's a brilliant answer and very, very informative, but they got the points. <laughs> they got the points. Oh, they yes. got the points. But fingers back on your buzzers <laughs> for the next open. Now, have a look at this. This is James Bond's car. But what did Corgi change to make it more appealing to 60s children? They put in an ejector okay. seat. No, there was an ejector seat in the original. Did they put a, a, a James Bond figurine in it? No, they didn't, no, because I, there was a sort of James Bond figurine, although he, I'm not saying that Sean Connery was a, more <laughs> a figurine. He was a good deal more than that, and many believe he was the best, apart from Patrick Trout, obviously. So, uh, now, <laughs> you, uh, you are going to have another go at this. What did they do to change it? Was it the colour? 
because it's from the film Goldfinger, isn't it? Yes. So they've made it gold. They made it gold. <laughs> they thought kids would prefer a gold car, so they thought the silver car would just look unpainted. So they, they did indeed make it gold. So you get the next specialist question. Have a look at this. So here's your specialist question for two points. Who made this in 1904 and which event in 1902 guaranteed the toy's popularity? I think, I think this is a Steiff bear made in Germany, but I think it commemorates something to do with President Roosevelt and um, Teddy Roosevelt. And I think it was in, when he was out shooting one day and he refused to shoot a bear. Is that right? Yes, that's completely correct. Good, two points. But tell me a little bit more about it, Lars. Uh, Roosevelt was invited to go to some American state where they had too many bears, and um, he went out with the party. They couldn't find a bear, so they thought they'd do him a favour by getting a bear and chaining it up to a pole and saying to Mr Roosevelt, well, there you are, Mr Roosevelt, you can take your shot from here. And he just couldn't. The tears welled up in his eyes. <laughs> Let's assume that he did something like that. OK. <laughs> the company that was already making what we call teddy bears, I don't know what they called them before they were called teddy bears, mm. um, they saw a marketing opportunity when the story came out in the press. Mm. And they said, oh, this little bear looks just like the ones we sell. Um, we, we're going to call them in honour of you, Mr Roosevelt. We're going to call them teddy bears. But also there was a popular market for them in England because of King Edward... The seventh, is it? Mm. So the Steiff lot were so the on world the money. Went teddy, teddy mad. mad. Margareta Steiff began manufacturing soft toy animals in the 1880s in Germany. One of those ideas where you think, I wonder if this will catch on. <laughs> 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 Originally, though, they were made as pin cushions. Uh, by 1907, the company was turning out nearly a million bears a year. And this particular gentleman dates from 1904. It's in good nick. Okay, we're ready for another one point opener. Here are two successful dolls, Barbie and Cindy. Barbie's long term partner is Ken, but who is Cindy's significant other? Andy? Not Andy. Oh, we're thinking Kevin. Not Kevin, no. <laughs> we just thought No, Kippy. you're both failing to recognise oh, or remember Paul. We're staying with these two. Yeah. Oh god, babes. two dollies. In this picture of Barbie and Cindy, which one is Cindy? The one on the right hand side the one in the ballet skirt. On the right in the ballet <laughs> skirt. Kate. Yes. You've got a specialist question. And okay. It's a dress for a six-year-old. What personal event might have been expected to bring its wearing to an end? To bring its wearing to an end? Oh, is this for a little boy? Yes. And he wore, initially, young boys and girls both wore dresses until they were between about five to seven, and when then they, they were, were breached, breached, which meant that they wore trousers. And so it was a very significant occasion. It meant he was becoming a grown-up little man. And Into it was, the course, man's world. Of course, linked to potty training as well, because it's much easier to change children when they just had skirts on. It's a very full and very correct answer that gains you two points. <laughs> the boy in this case was called Theophilus Wilway. Boys wore dresses until they were given their first pair of breeches or trousers, which happened between the ages of four and eight years old. They might also get their first haircut or be given a child-sized sword to mark the event. These days, of course, it's the traditional mobile phone. <laughs> Another item. Look at this, invented in 1834. Mm -hmm. This is a zoetrope, an early animation toy. Now, the name comes from the Greek tropos, meaning turning, but what does zoe mean? Life. You know, it means life. One point to you, so you get the final specialist question. Ooh. Now, this is a board game from around 1850 called A New Game of the History of England. It features the battles of Trafalgar, Navarino, Waterloo and Serengipatan. Which is the earliest and which is the most recent of these battles? And what was their significance? 
Okay, so we've got uh, Trafalgar and, and Waterloo, which are part of the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. Uh, Saint-Bertin? Saint and Navarino. And Navarino. So they are going to be... Peninsula well, War? East-West? No, West? No, I think if Navarino is part of the War of the Spanish Succession, this would be the earlier, earlier. one. Earlier, yeah. Yeah, and... and that's the, one of the late... Oh, and no, hang on, no. That would Trafalgar. then be Clive of India, and then, then you end up with, with Trafalgar, Trafalgar, Trafalgar Waterloo. then Waterloo. Yeah. You're wrong. Ugh. So, we're going to pass it over to the other side. Let's move That's... the board game over to them. OK, have a look at it. Kate and Halley, we're looking for the earliest battle and the most recent in this history, which culminates in the middle in the accession of Queen Victoria. It's an interesting view of history, but we've correctly identified Waterloo and Trafalgar. Yes. Well, we know that that's 1805 and 1815. But we've got Serengi Patam and Navarino. Which was the first of those four? We think it's Trafalgar. And the last? Serengi Patam. No, so oh. none of you got this. Oh. In fact, the Battle of Serengi Patam is the earliest. Oh, in dear. 1799, oh, in the Fourth oh, Anglo Mysore War between the East India Company and the Kingdom of Mysore. And it consolidated British control over India. So the Battle of Navarino yeah. in 1827 uh -huh. is the most recent because it helped secure Greek independence from the Ottoman uh -huh. Empire. And effectively, it was the last battle to take place with only sailing ships. Taking mm. part, and that was in 1827. Rather wonderful board game, though, isn't it? Rather splendid, because what happened during the 19th century, the upper and middle classes suddenly found themselves with more leisure time, so it became a boom period for indoor entertainment. Amongst popular parlour games of the period was hot cockles, in which a blindfolded person has to identify who in the room has just kicked him, and Snapdragon, which involved trying to retrieve raisins from the bottom of a bowl of brandy which had been set on fire. Thank goodness board game manufacturers stepped in to stop the Victorians making their own entertainment. And at the end of the round, it's time to find out how we're doing on the scores. Well, Kate and Hallie, you've got three, but Lars and Nina, seizing those objects as they came in, you've rushed ahead with seven. Ooh! <laughs> Good. We now have some toys coming to the table. One for each team. We're going to get two accounts of these toys. One is true and one is a fairy story. But can their opponents identify which is which without the help of comical nose extensions? It's time <laughs> for a question of attribution, Call of Duty, <laughs> Doll Warfare 3. <laughs> Let's hear from Lars and Nina first and we'll put the doll in front of Kate and Hallie for their inspection. So, Lars, would you like to tell us what this is? OK. You can see it's now been dressed in hip 1960s, 70s garb, but at its heart there you have a, a German 1930s monkey, a pet monkey. And uh, this monkey has rather a special story. It came over with a child who was on the kinder transport, fleeing... Uh, Germany in the 1930s and it became such an important memory of the survival of this particular child that it was passed down through the generations. The irony is that the family name of this monkey that escaped Herr Hitler uh, is his name is Hermann. Okay, so Nina you have another story relating to this. I this do. Doll. As you can see the clothes are 1960s and the monkey itself is 1960s, made of nylon stockings and made as a sort of a, a teaching aid uh, by a, a governess for two boys that were in her care so that they could create stories, building up a whole world for the monkeys to inhabit. And his name is not Herman, his name is Angle. So, that's Angle the monkey the creator of stories, or Herman, the monkey who made a trip from Germany. OK. I don't... My sense is, I mean, this looks very nylon-y to me, I have to say. He does look nylon-y tights. Yeah. But then I find the idea of the, 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 the kinder transport very... Compelling. Very compelling, and it's the reason why he'd be here mm. and why he'd be kept, why he'd be conserved as special. 
Oh, I'll get it wrong. No, you, you, I'll get it wrong. I give up. Hallie, don't let okay, Kate prevaricate okay, anymore. Okay. You go. <laughs> Tell me. Although I am not completely convinced of this, let's go for Herman the German monkey. Is it Herman the German monkey, Lars? He's actually an Angle, not a German. Oh, oh no, no, you were wrong. Oh, always kill your instincts. Oh, this are. is one of a troop of soft monkey toys made in the 1960s out of old stockings. Two brothers filled three exercise books with details of monkey society, the monkey's religious views, monkey judicial systems, and monkey political struggles. And the BBC have been broadcasting a long running adaptation of this called Today in Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're we going to bring in another object. Wow. So here she is. Gorgeous. Hallie and Kate. Who is she? Hallie, do you want to go first? So this is one of a set of three fashion dolls made by a fashion doll maker in Germany called Karl Mendel. And the three dolls were named after the three eldest daughters of Queen Charlotte and George III. And it was such a sumptuous and deluxe one that Carl Mendel gave her and the, the two other ones to Queen Charlotte. And then eventually it was given to the museum by Queen Mary at around the eve of the First World War. There we are. Kate, you have another fairy story to put before yes, us. Yes, this is... Uh... Mrs. Kander from the School for Scandal, the uh, 1777 play by uh, Sheridan. This was a you know, very famous actress role, but uh, she was actually uh, made uh, much later than the 1770s. She was made in the 1930s. So, is this a character from the School for Scandal? Or is it a German fashion doll? Um, I don't think that this is that old, do you? What do you think? Well, you see, the hair looks old and dusty. I mean, to me, that looks like a, an 18th century doll and a really rather, in, rather a fine one, actually. It's got Kirby grips in it. Yeah, I think it's modern. It could be just a very, very clever forgery. I'm yeah. happy to go okay. with you. I'm going to take a punt that I think Kate is telling the truth. So, Kate, are you telling the truth? I am telling the truth. Yeah. She was a fake made in the 1930s. And she even tricked the buyers at the museum who believed that she was a genuine 18th century fashion doll. So, Lars, you are not far <laughs> off. <laughs> and I obviously have the superior eye, Lars. <laughs> They're not getting one over on you, Nina. This <laughs> is Mrs Kander, a character from Sheridan's School for Scandal, fraudulently created in the 20th century as an attempt to prove that entertainment franchises had been around for 200 years longer than suspected. After that entertaining fantasy, we return to grim reality, because the scores now stand <laughs> as follows. Kate and Halle, no. you still have three. Oh, no. You haven't lost any points at all. Oh, that's one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Lars and Nina, you've gained some points there, and you're now at ten. Oh. Are you unassailable? We shall see, because we're going on now to our guided tour. I'm going to take each of the teams on a quick whip around the museum. Lars and Nina, put on your gumboots and form a crocodile. You're coming first. I have two objects for you, three questions and three points available, but only one connection. OK, here we are, two objects. Now, this is your first object, this tiny little and rather obvious Christmas card, no points for that. And if you seek the second object, look all about you. It's the building. So your first question, this museum houses the V&A collection of childhood memorabilia, but how are we connected with South Kensington in a more physical way? I think I know this. Right. Good, that's... OK. That's when helpful. the... What is now the, the South Kensington Museum complex was being developed, there was a sequence of iron structures made to house the collections before the permanent buildings were put up. And those were dismantled, and three of those arches were needed a new home. This part of the structure was offered up, and it ended up with a permanent home 
here in Bethnal Green. Correct. You certainly get your one point there. OK, here's your second question. Here is a Christmas card from around 1890, but out of three things illustrated here, Father Christmas's red outfit, the Christmas cracker, and what was then called the safety bicycle, but which was the most up-to-date at the time of this Christmas card? At the time of the card, OK. OK. The Father Christmas in the red suit, I just have this ringing memory about it being a result of the Coca-Cola advertising campaign, because he's traditionally St Nicholas in green, and then I seem to remember something about him wearing red in an advert. In fact, the Coca-Cola ads that mm. used the red costume date from the 1930s. Mm. The Father Christmas red look here, mm. especially with the fur trimmed, was invented by an American cartoonist called Thomas Nast, working in the 1860s. And what about the Christmas cracker? I'd have thought that was a Victorian invention, but whether it's before the safety bicycle, mm. I think the safety bicycle is the high-tech thing on yeah. this card. Yeah. That's my guess. The safety bicycle was, in fact, invented in 1885, so this one Gosh. here is bang up to date. OK. So I'm going to give you your point there. The cracker, of course, was invented in 1846 mm -hmm. by Thomas Smith in, in England, in London. So. We're moving on. This is your final question. Which individual connects the Christmas card and the building? Oh, we know this, don't we? It's the amazing Henry Cole, who worked with the Prince Consort uh, after, or well, during the Great Exhibition of 1851, and then transformed it into what we now know as the V&A. And Henry Cole, amongst all of his other uh, uh, accomplishments, he invented the whole idea of the Christmas card. Henry Cole invented the Christmas card in 1843, and he was the same man who became the director of the South Kensington Museum yeah. and therefore was, I suppose, responsible for giving Bethnal Green this museum. Well done, that's three points. I'm well now done. going to find out how Hallie and Kate get on. Once again, it's three questions and three points to make one connection. Right, two figures. Of fun. Here's your first question. Where in 1956 did this particular design of robot originate? America? Is it mm. American robots? I don't think that's enough. I need a little no. bit more detail than that. No. Maybe from, I don't know, a sci fi mm. film or television program? An American sci fi TV show. Possibly. Mm. Well, you're in the right area. Well, is he called Robbie the Robot? He's called Robbie the Robot. Uh, what sort of robot do you think, Hallie? I don't think he'll be a menacing I robot, think... and especially not if he is something cuddly that appeals arms. to children. Mm. He's, he's not going to be scary. Friend, cuddly, friendly, helpful yes. robot. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so far we have the idea that he's a cuddly, friendly robot from some sort of TV or s filmed science fiction series made in America. And you want the title? <laughs> I would like a little bit more than that about his origins, but actually, oh. I'm going to stop you because he comes from the MGM film Forbidden Planet, oh. made in 1956, oh, which was an oh, enormous dear. worldwide hit. I can't give you a point for that. Oh, dear. So Sorry, we're moving Bobby. on to the next one. This is a marionette, but where did that name derive from? It's a French, a French name. Sounds French. Sounds yes. French. Well. I would guess, I mean, Marion might have something to do with Mary. Mm. Maybe the figurines you might find in a nativity scene in a crib of some sort. So you're thinking Mary the Virgin Mary? Yes, I mm. am. Well, you're right. <laughs> it is a diminutive of the Virgin Mary, and you're, it wasn't actually for a, a nativity play, but another, another festival, the 15th of August. Feast of the Assumption. The Feast oh, of the Assumption well of the Virgin Mary into heaven. And the... Marionette, in its fully fledged form, didn't really emerge until the 19th century, articulated limbs and strings, and an early marionette would have just been on a stick acting out this, um, this moment. So, um, you got that one, and you get that point. Let's move on to our final question. These two figures are both, funnily enough, called Robbie. One is Robbie the robot, and the other is Robin Goodfellow, but what else connects them both? Both helpful and friendly characters. <laughs> I think that sounds like a good guess. Yes, that's quite nice. Uh, actually, he's not. Robin Goodfellow is not particularly friendly and not particularly helpful. Any guesses at where Robin Goodfellow comes from? He looks a bit like Puck from Midsummer yeah. Night's Dream. This is indeed Puck from 
uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, in the quarto yes. and the folio, he's constantly referred to as Robin Goodfellow. Oh, That's yes. his character name, and it's only in the Arden Shakespeare that they go back to calling him Puck throughout. So, he is obviously a fairy from Shakespeare. What about Robbie? Well, he's definitely not a fairy. Doesn't look like a fairy. No, um... well, that's where you're wrong, I'm afraid. He is also a fairy from Shakespeare. Oh, really? sorry, Robbie. Because, you're a Shakespeare um, fairy? I'm afraid so, because Forbidden Planet was loosely based oh. on oh. The Tempest. Oh. oh. And so, it, he's unbelievably, a, he's if aerial. you look at him, he is Ariel. I'm yes. sorry, Robbie. Oh, well, mm. oh, dear. So, uh, I'm afraid I can only give you one, one point. One? Let's get back to the desk to add up the scores. And so we return from our wanderings in space and time to gaze in wonder at the scores. Kate and Hallie, you got one point there. I'm sorry to have to tell you, though, that Lars <laughs> and Nina managed to garner three points, which means that they are standing at 13 and you are standing at four. But 13, what a magnificent score. And you might be able to add to that as we go on into our final quick fire round, here's a uniform worn by the members of which organisation? Thunderbirds. Not Thunderbirds. Oh, no, the International Rescue. International yeah. Rescue. Oh. Good. If fingers on the buzzers again, <laughs> because this is a Magic Lantern slide. But what children's classic does it portray? Peter Pan. Peter Pan, Nina. Yes. This doll's house was made in 1673. What does the unicorn? Oh! It tells us that it was the house of an apothecary or chemist because it, that was their sign. That was the profession of the occupants. They were apothecaries. Look at this. What are the pouches for on this girl's nightcap? Catching fleas. Not catching fleas. Oh, no. Curls. No, curls. Curls. Oh, sorry, they were setting sorry. her curls. This is an Italian Presepio scene. What city is the centre of their manufacture? Naples. Naples, yes. This is Action Man. By what name is he known in the United States? G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, Nina. The first Rubik's Cubes hit the toy shops in 1977. What is their Hungarian inventor's first name? No, you have Ermo. to... Ermo. No, not Ermo, no. Oh, God. Uh, Ernest. Ernest. Uh, no, Ernest. yes, you're quite right. Yes, you got that. Good. <laughs> Don't get into a real estate. You're well ahead. Let's you're let, ahead. Let, let the girls have just one crumb from your table. <laughs> it's Christmas. What feature of this teething stick was supposed to prevent the spread of evil? Coral. The coral, yes, indeed. This is He-Man, a master of the universe. But what was the name of his nemesis? Skeletor. Skeletor, oh. yes. This is an 18th century pudding hat for toddlers. What was it used for, Kate? When they were walking, it meant when they fell, they wouldn't hurt their heads. Yes, like protect them when they fell over while learning to walk. Who joined Santa's sleigh team in 1939? Rudolph. Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, and the sound of Santa's <laughs> sleigh bells tells me that playtime has to come to an end. But before we hang up our stockings and go to bed, let's have a look at our final scores. Kate and Hallie. You did very, very well in that round because you got some so. points and made up your total to nine. Oh. But I'm afraid it is only half of Lars and Nina's triumphant score of 18. So many congratulations. <laughs> You've won the last of our series because we've come to the end of our time here in this, the world's ultimate toy box. As F. Scott Fitzgerald said, being grown up is a terribly hard thing to do. It's much easier to skip it and go from one childhood to another. And so, we must thank the museum here today for preserving so many childhood memories for us. Thank you. Goodbye and Merry Christmas. <laughs>